Welcome to What Can You Do With Python? My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This course is a little different from your typical one, as it's an overview of the Python ecosystem. I won't be teaching you Python or any particular library. I'll be showing a whole bunch of topics and what libraries you can use to play in each space. The Python ecosystem is huge. At the time of this recording, there are over 600,000 projects on the Python Packaging Index, and it wasn't that long ago that I made a similar statement in another course when the number was 500,000 or so. That means there are lots of different kinds of things you can accomplish with Python, whether to solve a particular problem or just play around to learn some more. This course groups the topics into related sections. The first section covers typical software projects like writing code for the web, command line tools, text-based UIs, GUIs, and games. The second section covers a large yet rapidly growing space in the Python ecosystem, data science and math. There are lots of scientific libraries out there to squeeze information out of your data. In this topic, I'll touch on machine learning, general science libraries, visualization, and libraries for scraping the web in order to grab some data for processing when an API hasn't been provided. The third section is about embedded systems. That's microcontrollers and robotics. And finally, the fourth section is about the developer experience. This talks about using code to maintain infrastructure, development environments, packaging, interacting with databases, and doing automated tests. Next up, I'll start out section one with some cool software projects. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll start section one, talking about typical software projects you can create in the Python domain. When you visit a web page, somewhere a server is turning your URL request into some HTML content. That server might be running Python. There's a wide variety of approaches where some servers output HTML code directly for the browser, while others are single page applications that download a JavaScript application to the browser. Single page applications still need to communicate with the server through an API, and the code for that API can also be in Python. Native mobile development often takes this approach as well, with web technologies happening on the server side that the mobile communicates with. This is still one of the largest segments of Python work and has a fairly high level of job demand. There are a number of different frameworks out there, each with their pros and cons. Let me quickly show you one of the more popular ones, Django. This is a simple website from a course on writing APIs for the web. This page is straight HTML. But then when I click on the Peru link, this page is a mix. It starts out with HTML to build it, but then I can reorganize items in the schedule by dragging them around. This uses an API to update the positional information in the database on the server. Same goes with the add and delete buttons. This example is built on a framework called Django. One of Django's superpowers is that it includes both web and database tools and comes with an admin utility for managing things you store in the database. Let me visit the admin. That's another thing that Django gives you out of the box, authentication management. Let me sign in. This is a small project. It only has four kinds of things in the database. Users and groups are part of the authentication module, while entries and timelines are my objects in the database. If I click on entries, I see a list of all the entries. Some of these were in the Peru page I showed you before. If I click on one of the entries, I get the fields for this record in the database. I can edit this, add new records, or delete it. All this comes almost for free. If you've written the code to declare what your database objects look like, it only takes an extra line or two to register that same object in this admin tool. Some really famous places out there use Django, like Pinterest, YouTube, and one of my favorite places, The Onion. So just what kind of tools are out there? The site I just demoed was built using the Django framework. When you write code for the web, you typically need a view, that's code that generates a page, a route, that's a thing that ties a URL to your view, and often you'll need somewhere to store your data, like a database. An object relational mapping is an object-oriented mechanism for accessing that database. 
Django comes with all this and more out of the box. Because Django comes with so much, it can be overkill for certain kinds of projects. If you only need to build an API, then Fast API might be the right choice for you. It uses Python type hints to declare what values a function takes and automatically generates an API based on the registered functions. The library is so popular that it's even spawned clones. Django Ninja is a library that adds Fast API like functionality to a Django project. Flask is a lightweight web framework that's similar to Django. It concentrates on the views and routes parts of things, but there are plenty of third-party add-ons to provide authentication and other features. Personally, my default is Django, because if you're building a full site, you're going to need a lot of Flask add-ons, which in the end are just doing what Django does. But if I need to quickly put something together for testing, nothing beats Flask to get something going in a flash. Tornado is fast. I mean, really fast. Although it is considered a web framework, typically it gets used as an endpoint. If you need to scale an API to crazy performance levels, Tornado might be the library for you. RealPython has lots of content on web development, and this first link is a list of tutorials to help you dig in. Clickable versions of the links shown on these slides are below in the notes. For Django-specific tutorials, see this list. And this tutorial is a hands-on project that shows you how to build a resume site to show off your skills. There's also a topic list of Flask tutorials, and this tutorial covers how to use Fast API. Next up, more cool software projects. In the previous lesson, I covered some of the libraries for web development. In this lesson, I'll cover some ways to improve the interface to your command line programs. When you write a script to run in a terminal, you may want to give that script arguments to control what it does. This is called the command line interface, and there are libraries out there to help you parse the parameters to your program. There's a convention to how command line arguments look. You don't have to follow it, but it makes it easier for users to understand your program if you stick with it. The convention breaks things down into arguments, that's something like a file name, and flags, which usually are preceded by one or two hyphens. If you've ever done dash dash help or dash h, you were using this capability. To start out, Python comes with a very powerful, very flexible, sometimes a little difficult to use library for handling arguments and flags. In fact, Python comes with several, but the most modern one that you should be using is argparse. Since argparse is a bit complicated, that tends to be a consequence of powerful and flexible, there are also third party libraries out there that have simpler interfaces. Click uses decorated functions to minimize the amount of code you need to write for arguments and flags. And a competitor to Click is Typer. It's by the same folks as FastAPI and uses a similar approach. Personally, I use argparse, but that's mostly because I already put the effort in to learn it. If you're just getting started and you're okay with using third-party libraries for your project, either Click or Typer are good choices. This is a tutorial on using argparse. And this one compares argparse, click, and another library I didn't mention called docopt. This tutorial is specific to using click. And finally, if you want to try a full project that just happens to use the command line, this one shows you how to build a script that prints out directory trees. You control how it behaves with arguments handled through argparse. You've probably heard of GUI development with Windows and Widgets, your typical desktop interface. Well, a TUI is the same kind of idea, but using only text widgets. As such, it runs completely inside your terminal. This can be helpful as terminals are more standardized than GUI environments, so these kinds of programs are more likely to work across platforms. Most of the time, you can also run these on remote machines through SSH as well. There's been a sort of renaissance lately with TUIs, partially due to a newer library called Textual, and there are a load of projects out there, some seriously useful and some just fun. This is TipTop, which I grabbed using the typical pip install command. This program gives you similar information to the top Unix command, showing you just what's running on your system, but it does it with a colorful display and graphs. Tools like Textual allow you to lay out the screen with just a few lines of code, along with colorization and other features. There's some neat stuff out there, including a terminal-based piano. Yeah, you heard me right, a piano. 
For color and stylization of your terminal output, start with a library called Rich. It's by the same folks as Textual. In fact, Textual is built on top of Rich, and it uses CSS to do the layout of the screen. So if you already know your web stuff, you're ahead of the game. Another Tweet toolkit is Askematics. This one's a little more focused on terminal animations. The demo includes a text-based squid flying around the screen. A smaller part of the library includes forms and windowing, which covers a lot of the same kind of ground as textual. Although TUIs have been around for a long time, that renaissance I mentioned is rather recent, but there are still tutorials for you at RealPython. This first one teaches you how to stylize your output with Rich. Well, this one uses Rich to build a Wordle clone. Shh, don't tell the New York Times. And if you want something a little bigger, this project uses both textual and SQL tools to build a contact book application. Next up, I'll move from text to graphics. 